the motor racing heroes take on a team of turbocharged comedy characters. Then these celebrities roll out the big wheel Saturday. Good evening, Australia. On the program tonight, a story about racism in Australia, about Asian discrimination, about a woman who says she was sacked from her job not because she was Oriental, but because she was not. That story is out of Queensland. We'll be looking at the bloodbath in the skies, the discount war between ANSET, Australian, and the new wings on the tarmac, Compass. There's more trouble for our long-suffering farmers with a plague of foxes. It's the third time in the past week that James and his mate Andrew have braved the cold in an effort to rid the property of officially classified vermin who will eat just about anything. And speaking of vermin, how about the Mad Hatter's Tea Party masquerading as the ALB convention in Hobart? All that manoeuvring and they still couldn't decide on a eunuch to play at party president. They only solved it when Barry Jones, with a flash of his legendary intelligence and common sense, actually pulled out. Steve Weizard put it best last night when he said it was perfect to hold the ALP conference at a casino. That way they did not have to import a crap table. And remember this little gem from the Prime Minister during the last election campaign. If you can't govern your party in opposition, then there's no way you can govern the country. Yep, even in government, ain't that the truth. I'm Darren Hinch. <laughs> Tonight, as I mentioned briefly in my opening comments, a discrimination story with a difference. Last week, 30-year-old Kelly Neal was sacked from her secretarial job. She claims she was dismissed because her boss prefers Asian women. Today, as Janine Hosking reports, Kelly and her family and her friends were on the warpath. Well, there's enough. There's a lot of Australians unemployed. It's getting worse and they're just in, getting, bringing more people in all the time to take our jobs. She, she was capable of doing the job, which they should have given her a chance, but because not being Asian, it's not fair. Well, I began to resent Asians. I mean, I'm not prejudiced, but I thought, this man's creating animosity and resentment between us and Asians. Well, he has now between me and... 30-year-old Kelly Neal and her family and friends are protesting over what they claim is discrimination. Little did Kelly know that her new job at Central Breaks and Services in Brisbane would result in an angry picket line. On the 3rd of June, Kelly was employed by this business as a Girl Friday. She had responded to a CES advertisement which called for the following. Must be experienced in all of the above, stable work history, confident and pleasant phone manner, well presented and good diction. With her steady employment background and experience in office work, Kelly was told that she fitted the bill perfectly. But three weeks later, she was out in the cold, sacked. Now Kelly is claiming racism because an Asian girl replaced her. Kelly was employed by this woman, office manager Doris Lowe. Kelly claims that Doris told her that their boss, John Nemnick, preferred Asian women. Doris Lowe also said numerous amounts of times that John Nemnick really liked Asian women. For the first couple of weeks, Kelly thought the job was going well, but it was Doris who had to break Kelly the news that she'd been sacked. And as this reference indicates, the sacking was through no fault of Kelly's. And when she gave me my week's notice, she said to me, um, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but, and I sort of looked at her, she goes, I'm having to give you a week's notice. And I just sort of looked and I said, why? I said, what have I done? And she said, nothing. She said, you're a really good worker. You've picked it up really quickly and you're the easiest girl I've ever trained. But John said, quote, if anybody says anything, just say I'm Asian orientated. Kelly's former boss, John Nemnick, who is based in Newcastle, was unavailable for comment. But the company's marketing manager, Glenn Taylor, was happy enough to show us through the workplace. The company has three outlets, two in Queensland and one in Newcastle, and employs 30 people. Three of them are Asian. The company's been operating for over 30 years by the same owner during that time. And uh, if we had an Asian preference, then I think you'd see it in our factory and in the number of staff that we do employ. Mr Taylor says that the conflict has been created by his office manager, Doris, who put the wrong advertisement in the paper. He says that the job was more suited to a qualified bookkeeper. She should never have advertised for a girl Friday. She should have advertised for a bookkeeper. 
and she realises that now and admits her mistake. It's just unfortunate. Now, was Kelly asked if, if she could do the bookkeeping? Uh, I'm not too sure, but she may have been, but she wasn't qualified as a bookkeeper. She said, I've had accountants and bookkeepers and qualified people apply, but I don't want them. She says, because they'll get bored. Today, flanked by her new Asian bookkeeper, Doris denied all Kelly's accusations. I've made a mistake in hiring Kelly when I should hire Pauline, which is a qualified bookkeeper. Is Kelly lying when she says that she was told by you that uh, John had said that just tell her we're Asian orientated? Was she lying about that? Yes. No, I really resent that because I've never been a liar. I'm not racist and I'm not a liar. Meanwhile, Mr Taylor vehemently refuted the allegation that his boss preferred Asian women. He has uh, had from time to time a, an Asian girl do some um, administration work for him in Sydney, but that's uh, on a sort of on-off basis, nothing regular at all. Kelly has already contacted the Equal Opportunities Board and she has plenty of support. But not sacking her just to employ an Asian because he prefers Asian people. I mean, that's not right, is it? Not in an Australian country. But I think when it comes to Asians in our workplace, fair enough, we should help them, but not at the expense of ourselves. And I guess that one will be left to the Equal Opportunity Authorities in Brisbane to sort out. Plane tickets are expensive these days if you pay full fare. But if you get involved in the domestic airline discount war, then plane tickets, some plane tickets, and I stress the word some, some of them are dirt cheap. Some fares are cut by 65%. A round trip Melbourne Perth ticket, for example, only $200 for some people. And as Pamela Graham reports, the new kid on the block, Compass, had this full page ad, full page offering for passengers, giving them one free ticket for every ticket paid for by July 15. Industry observers are saying the airline's fare war is a battle to the death. But who's going to break? Who's going to the wall first? The airfare price cuts were announced on Sunday, but travellers who hesitated were lost. If you didn't move fast, you missed out on Australian Airlines' offer of a once-only $200 Melbourne to Perth and return ticket. You couldn't drive over there for that amount of money, and, uh, and the decision was made over the breakfast table this morning, and the girls were told at 12.30 when I picked them up from school and said we're going to see Nanny in Perth. The bit of price slashing started when Australian Airlines offered reductions up to 65% from July until mid-September. ANSET matched the offer and raised the stakes keeping their travel option open until the end of April. Australian Airlines then upped the ante, making discount travel available immediately. Australian Airlines, ANSET and Compass might be stating publicly that the drastic discounts of 65% on regular fares are their way of beating the recession. But airline industry analysts see it as a fight to the death to squeeze one airline out of the market after the deregulation of the airline industry late last year. I think it'll certainly be a, a tough fight between uh, the three major competitors um, and we might see at the end of that period uh, possibly one of the competitors uh, not being there. The newest domestic carrier, Compass, undercut both big players with an offer of a free ticket with every $352 return Melbourne to Sydney airfare. The airline business is a big daily cash flow generator, but it must be remembered ANSET and Australian Airlines have massive overheads, major engineering operations, enormous aircraft leasing costs, huge staff payrolls. Compass, although only flying four aircraft, has already captured a little more than 6% of the national market. ANSET and Australian each command about 40% share of the market. This airfare war will be cutting into profits and the unknown factor is the unknown effect that two more airlines which are due to come into operation next year will have on competition. So it's likely we will continue to see volatile airfare prices for the next three years. And for his comments on the air war in our Brisbane studio, the Chief Executive of Compass Airlines, Mr Brian Gray, good evening. Good evening. I should be on behalf of consumers saying to you, go for it, sell tickets for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 dollars. <laughs> I hope it doesn't get that low. But, but how can you do it? Well, it's a matter of having the, the size aircraft that can economically operate at the type of level we're talking about. We're oper charging an $85 fare Melbourne, Sydney, $90 Sydney, Brisbane. Uh, but of course, they're, they're the lowest fares. They don't actually indicate the level of airfare which you gather right across all of the seats on the aircraft. 
Uh, we're only offering 20 to 30 seats at those fares on each flight. So what you're doing is taking a few um, targeted seats on each plane and saying these will go at this rate, is that it? That's exactly right and that's to encourage people to fly because you know there's pretty tough times out there and the economy is very depressed. Uh, people have stopped flying over the last oh, 5, 10, 15 years because the airfares were so high and we have to now teach them to fly again. Now in my introduction uh, tonight uh, we showed one of your advertisements saying buy a ticket now we'll give you another free one. Um, is that because it's good business or because you need the money now up front? Well, it's not so much the money. The thing is we have got the capacity. We've introduced four new wide-body aircraft and they're very large aeroplanes and we, we are publicising a number of services. For example, with the four aircraft, we're now going to operate five round trips Melbourne, Sydney a day. We're also moving into Adelaide with Melbourne, Adelaide and Sydney, Adelaide services. And we believe quite sincerely that if we can get people to fly on Compass, they will stay with us because the aeroplane is so superior. What are the restrictions? I mean, do I have to fly, you know, with a three-legged dog and a one-legged man at three o'clock in the morning to get the cheap one? No, you can take your four-legged dog, but as far as we're concerned, there are no restrictions except that you must pay for the fare within 72 hours of making the booking, and it is a non-refundable ticket that you're getting on this cheap airfare. There have to be some restrictions because obviously the airlines are in the business of selling the higher class fare. Now our compass class or economy class fare is 20% less than Ansett and Australian's economy class fare and as I say in a much superior aircraft so we're offering a good deal even for the the top uh, top paying dollar. You've always been a good salesman. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> How are your shares? Well the shares are about 43 cents at the moment very disappointing because they're a 50 cent share we think they're worth a lot more than that uh, but we obviously have to get some runs on the board we've only been going seven months we did have some upsets with the delivery of our aircraft we expected to introduce our third and fourth aircraft in February March and they were delayed but we've now got the four our forward bookings are looking excellent and we're very confident of the future for Compass. One of your competitors is a government owned airline, the other one is owned by the Prime Minister's best mate who sits in on, he, on his decisions when he decides whether he'll stay at the lodge or not. It puts you pretty much out in the cold, doesn't it? Well look, we haven't sought favours from anyone, we've never been to a politician to, uh, to uh, ask for a favour and I think that's one of our big advantages. We owe nothing to anybody, we're doing our own thing and we don't have to ask permission from anyone to do anything and we're in there to provide a good service to the public. We've stimulated the market to Perth. Cairns, for instance, is going through its best tourist period ever. Uh, budget have had to move another 50 vehicles up into Cairns simply to satisfy the demand generated by Compass and I think that's good for the economy. But as a, a businessman who's been around the airline world for a long time, you'd have to at least consider that here's two huge competitors in a discount war with David, two Goliaths and one David. If it gets really dirty and gets right down the rock bottom, how do you survive? Well, they have a bank account they have to satisfy as well, and I think they have more problems facing them than we have facing us because they are large as you say they've built up a lot of cost structure over the years which they now have to service those debts we're mean and lean we only have 150 staff members to each airplane whereas they have something like 400 to each aircraft and uh, that makes us a very very tough competitor because our operating cost our available seat kilometre cost is 7.5 cents theirs is 14.2 so we've got a lot of fat there that we can play with You'll be there in five years? We'll be there in 25 years. When they, well, when they plant me, they'll still be there. <laughs> All right. Mr. Gray, I've never flown you, but thanks for your time. Well, I look forward to seeing you on board. Bye now. From Compass Airlines, Mr. Brian Gray. Foxes were introduced into this country from England just over 100 years ago. Actually, they were first brought here in the 1860s. Now these predators and scavengers are increasingly preying on our native wildlife and as Jackie Crist reports tonight, they are causing yet another problem for farmers fighting a rural crisis. Eighty-four-year-old Price Hill has spent most of his life on this farm near Corriong, 425 kilometres northeast of Melbourne. It's a life Price loves, and with the help of his son James, the sheep and cattle farm prospers. But achieving that prosperity is no easy task. Price has battled nature for half a century to make the farm profitable. We got 
got the rabbits uh, pretty well under control, and then uh, dingoes, they, they t uh, took control. We've had the foxes with us all the time, but they've never been as bad as they are now. Farmers living in south and southeastern Australia say foxes are now in near plague numbers. What uh, sorts of troubles have you had with them? Oh, the, the uh, lambs, and uh, they, they took a calf, killed the calf, which I'd never ever heard of them doing before. Now, there's 175 ewes put in there that were all springing, and we've only marked 110 lambs. You could put uh, natural causes down to perhaps, oh well, 10% of the outside, and the rest of the foxes must have got. Looks like he got another one. Yep. Have to come out tonight. That's about six in the last week he's got. Let's see if we can come and get him. Some farmers believe conservationists are to blame for the growing numbers of foxes. The efforts of animal liberationists around the world and advertisements like this have put fur coats beyond the pale for most people. <laughs> People have been told it's not the right thing to wear fox fur or any fur. That's exactly the reason why there's so many about, because people won't, especially on a cold night, they won't go out and freeze, as it is very cold, um, just to get five or ten dollars a skin, where they used to get forty or fifty dollars for the skin. But while the Australian red fox is no longer worth hunting for its pelt, Farmers still have to protect their stock from its ravages. The hills say there's virtually no alternative but to shoot these cunning predators. Poisoning, they say, is too indiscriminate. After years of practice, James Hill is a crack shot with a rifle. Nine times out of ten, he'll get a fox. Um, we'll take the triple third night, I think, and get the magnum and check it over. Bullets in the drawer there. It's the third time in the past week that James and his mate Andrew have braved the cold in an effort to rid the property of officially classified vermin who will eat just about anything. Got him. Here he is. Uh, about a good sized dog. Yeah, good skin too. Won't cause any more damage. Right now, let's go. Are foxes difficult to shoot? Sometimes, yeah. If you're in a ute or a vehicle, you can't get as close. Sometimes when you're walking, you get really close to them and they're pretty easy then. But other times, they're not so easy. For James and Andrew, it's another cold and frustrating night. While there are many foxes on the property, most of them are smart enough to know that a ute and a spotlight means danger. So your problem is, is temporarily under control with the foxes that you've, that you've shot. When will you have to start all over again and, and go out at night? Well, same time next year, I suppose, when they, you start lambing again. I have to go out and into them again. So hopefully before they get too many more lambs, put it that way. Even though foxes are classed as vermin, the Animal Liberation Group insists that shooting them is an inhumane way to deal with the problem. Farmers who are forced to shoot their sheep these days obviously would not agree. I had my say earlier on the program tonight about the Mad Hatter's Tea Party in, in Hobart, but for his version of the ALP's national conference from Hobart, here's Richard Snare. In the 20 years it's been built, Hobart's Rest Point Casino has seen plenty of high rollers. The stakes here for the average punter are always pretty high. But there's a different game being played this week, where the stakes are much higher and the rules are there only to be bent. This is the scene for the national conference of the Australian Labor Party. A political party celebrating 100 years existence, 100 years of sharing sometimes divergent ideologies, 100 years of deals upon deals. 
The Australian Labor Party is, they say, unlike any other political party in the world. Where else would people who hate each other spend a week with each other, talk to each other and actually agree with each other, only to leave and go back to hating each other? The uh, centenary conference of our party is being held at a time of unprecedented dominance in the government of Australia. We govern federally and in five of the six states and the Australian Capital Territory. The golden backdrop for this conference is supposed to reflect the golden era of the Labor Party. It's an image many are trying hard to maintain, while others, it seems, are trying to destroy. And almost a decade of dominance at the state and federal level has again transformed us from a party of opposition to a party of government. But this could again be at risk if we don't take note of the lessons of the past. For the Labor Party, the past is very much here in Hobart, as is the future. This innocent-looking church hall was the scene of the disastrous split in the 1950s, which saw the evolution of the DLP and the virtual political isolation of the Labor Party federally for 23 years. Ever mindful of those years, the Labor Party for over a decade now has run a very tight ship. Controversial matters are not decided on the floor of the conference, in open debate, but rather a sort of open secrecy which everyone can watch but not always take part in. And so it was with the vote for the national presidency. After the factions could not agree on one person standing for the job alone, it went to a vote for the first time in 10 years. The result? Comrades, uh, rather an unexpected result in the election. It's a draw. <laughs> you, you may think that's un unusual with 101 votes, but uh, the situation is there was one informal. The wheeling and dealing had to start all over again. And for the first time in many years, the final say was going to be debated in the open. Well, I think in the, the hundredth year of the party, we've got to remain true to our traditions, and that means a real good old-fashioned factional stash. And I would hate to think that in its uh, hundredth year, the Labor Party was overlooking a, what is a very strong tradition. And why, why have a quiet conference when you can have a row at a conference? Just before we go tonight, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for our ratings last night. We won the night in all capital cities around Australia, including a record for this program, a 32 and a victory over a current affair in Perth where we're head to head with Yana, Yana Vent and her program. So on Tuesday, June the 25th, 1991, that's life. Good night.